Welcome to What is Going Om for new thought from the edge of Om. Each week on Om Times flagship radio show, veteran broadcaster, author, and media consultant Sandy Sedgebeer conducts thought provoking interviews with inspirational authors, artists, musicians, scientists, speakers, and filmmakers who are working at the point where spirituality and science meet consciousness at the very edge of Om. Here is your host, Sandy Sedgebeer. Hello and welcome. Today's show, I've got three questions to start with. Are you hearing an inner calling to wake up and remember who you really are? Do you have a compelling soul urge to return to ancient wisdom and the deep shamanic medicine within? Do you believe that you have access to an enchanted life? Joining me today to answer these questions and far more is shamanic visionary teacher, guide, and creator of the shamanic breathwork process, Star Wolf, the founder of the Venus Rising Association for Transformation and president of Venus Rising University for shamanic psycho-spiritual studies, Star Wolf is creator of the Shamanic Ministers Global Network and the Wise Wolf Council. She's also the author of 13 books, including Shamanic Breathwork, Journeying Beyond the Limits of the Self, Shamanic Mysteries of Peru, and her latest release, The Aquarian Shaman, Walking the Spiral Path of Transformation, which we'll be discussing today. Star Wolf, welcome. Mm, Thank you, Sandy. So good to be with you here today. So first, congratulations. The book has only just been published. Two days old, is that right? Yay! (laughs) Beautiful cover. Yes, it, it is, isn't it? It is. That's really so stunning. That cover. It really is. You know, I'd like to say I had some part in that, but I didn't. My the publishers, which are my wonderful, you know, publishing company, Bear and Company, Inner Traditions, which is they're just fabulous. Yeah, um, yeah. But they chose this and sent it to me, and I just said, "Oh," because I had some other things in mind, and I went, "This is it." So it was a real gift to be presented with something that so resonated. And immediately when you look at it, there's this feeling of, oh, this is what the Aquarian shaman is, the one who's on this path, who's found their trail, their path, like the wolf. Yes. Yeah. Mm. So in the Aquarian shaman, you share that your journey towards personal healing was a destiny waiting to be fulfilled. But you only recognize the necessity of self-focus at 29. You'd been unconsciously medicating your emotional pain with alcohol um, for many years. So what happened when you were 29? Well, in order to explain what happened when I was 29, I think you have to know what happened when I was 13 or 12, actually. And that's when my shamanic grandmother, which was my biological maternal grandmother, uh, and who believed in all these things that we believe in now and that we're doing, and she was from the old country, and uh, I called her a renegade Baptist because she was also praying to the fairies and the, the um, you know, Jesus at the same time. So she was the one who cared for me because my parents both worked, and she passed it when I was 12, and I was a little bit of a strange child, perhaps an only child. Um, some would say, you know, a fairy child. Some might say I had a little autism or something, but I was just a little different, you know. Um, And my grandmother recognized that and she put me in nature and she started talking to me about the ones that are watching over me and protecting me and all those kinds of things. So that was implanted very uh, early and it helped ground me rather than take me out. It helped ground me because of the spirit that I was. And when she died suddenly when I was 12, um, I, I just plummeted. There was no one else to really hold that. And it was, after all, the 1960s. And as I might be at my 13th birthday, shortly after she had passed, I started using alcohol and drugs at a very early age, um, mainly psychedelics and things. But it took me down a path of addiction. There was, it, in some ways, it saved my life, if you can understand that. It was like medicine. But because I didn't have anybody to support any kind of Um, counseling or support or understanding of altered states, um, I was a hot mess. And so, you know, I was a hippie marching for 
peace and all these kinds of things and Martin Luther King and, you know, um, all these things. And my heart and head was in the right place in that way. But my spirit just was lost and in my own soul loss. So it was through my own recovery at 29. And, and, and Sandy, no one in my whole family knew that I was addicted because I was so good. I was still that type A personality that managed to cover it up. And so what happened for me is that I, I hit a bottom, you know, I hit a, an emotional and spiritual bottom and I had to recognize. And when I literally was on my knees at the altar of my toilet in my bathroom, and I just said, I can't do this anymore. If I have to do this and live like this and live this double life, I would rather die. And I asked, I didn't even know what to ask. I believed in nebulous kinds of spirits and stuff. But I, I just said, you know, God, I don't know who or what you are or if you're even really there. But if you are, I promise to you that if you will remove this obsession from me, because that's what it was, this obsessive, addictive process from me, the rest of my life is yours. And then I went and laid down for about three hours and I fell into a deep sleep, which I never, ever did in the middle of the day. And when I woke up, I got up and I felt just kind of odd. And later on that night, I realized that I had not thought about drinking anything. And from that day till now, which is 42 years, 42 and a half years later, not one time has the compulsion. Now, this is a miracle, Sandy. This is a true miracle for anybody who's ever had an addiction with anything. I've never even had the thought or the compulsion since that time. So I knew that my higher power had made a bargain with me. <laughs> the rest of my life belonged to my creator. An interesting age because it's around about that time that we have our Saturn return, which is usually a hugely important um, transition in our lives. Yes, very yeah. much so. And the astrologer since then that I've talked to said, well, of course, that's when you had your shamanic initiation. Yeah. You know, your big one. I've had many before yeah. and since, even as a child and as an adult all these years. But that was the one where I made a choice to stay on this planet and to be here, fully be here. If I, if I couldn't be here and I was just going to be an addiction, I would have died pretty soon. Mm. And, of course, you became a certified alcohol and drug counsellor, did that for many, many years. One of the things um, that you've done that intrigues me is that you've you've actually studied a variety of breathwork techniques. I'm curious to know why would you want to study lots of different breathwork techniques? Well, you know, I think that for me, I also had this what uh, Stan Groff from Holotropic Breathwork called a COEX, Systems of Condensed Experience. <clears throat> that there tends to be patterns in people's lives that are intrinsic specifically to them. Maybe it's even decided before we come here. And I had breathing issues at birth. I had kind of breathing issues as a child with allergies and things like that. When I um, actually uh, had my, I had an overdose when I was a teenager, which didn't wake me up enough, <clears throat> but it did. And I, and when that happened, I did die and quit breathing. And I went out of my body and I looked back and saw myself and then for a few minutes and heard them say I wasn't going to make it. And the next thing I knew, I woke up. <clears throat> so and I'm just choking up a little bit thinking about it. And so, you know, just kind of remembering that then I've developed kind of almost like asthmatic symptoms, had lots of allergies, all those kinds of things. So there's been this almost failure to fully embody, to really come into this body. And I think maybe my soul said, are you sure you want to do this particular lifetime? Doesn't it seem like there's a whole lot of people that understand you, you know, there, you know, there's, this is a big one. If you're going to do this one, you know, if you're going to do this one, you're going to die a couple of times and then you can decide if you really want to live. And if you do, it's going to be a dedication to planetary service. Really? You know, it's kind of like I'm enlisted, you know, um, I'm an enlisted woman sort of thing. Shaman. And, you know, I just, I'm tearing up, Sandy. I can't help it because I have such a beautiful life and I've had such a beautiful life 
And that does not mean a life without turmoil, without heartbreak. You know, I've had many, many very human initiations that many people go through. I'm not special. We all, we all have heartbreak. We all have lost loved ones, you know, to this realm anyway, from this realm. And we've all been disappointed and we've all made mistakes. And mid, I think that everyone has their own private little addictions. Some aren't as devastating as others. And when we return to the breath and we start to learn to fully breathe, it's like we wake up. It's like we come out of a trance. People say we breathe to get altered. I say we breathe to get here, to get born. You know, I'm not breathing anymore to leave. I'm breathing to be here now, as my buddy Ram Dass would say. I am here to be here now. And there's all kinds of breathing techniques. And now there's a gazillion breathwork schools. When I started doing that, there was like three, you know. Mm -hmm. So I'm grateful to see this um, wonderful explosion of people waking up and saying, oh, perhaps I could go into an altered state that would expand my consciousness. And I could do this with, with the breath. I don't have to have anything else outside of me except love you know, and self-love and just to breathe and release this God molecule right between my eyes, you know, release this natural DMT in my own pineal gland yeah. and awaken to who I really am. Mm -hmm. So you've written 13 books. What inspired you to write this particular one? Well, this one would have been maybe six or seven or eight if I could have gotten it together to, to write it. And I judged myself for it. Like I keep starting this and then I put it down. And then I realized, uh, because I've, I have really wonderful astrologer friends and Daniel Giammario is one of my favorite astrology friends. I just talked to him the other day for an hour. We've been buddies <laughs> for a very long time, about 35 years. And he said to me, if you're going to write that book, you need to do it now. <laughs> this is the time, you know, and I thought maybe this is why I could. It's been playing around in my brain. I've, you know, written a chapter and threw it over here. I'd scribble on the back of a napkin with this. I did these things, but it just never felt like right timing. And I couldn't explain it to you, except it just didn't. And there were other things that were coming into my um view at times, you know, because I just was going to Peru. I was going to Egypt. In fact, I go to Egypt here just pretty soon, a couple of weeks. Um, and so, and Af South Africa. And so I would go and study the mysteries there and write about those. And so there were things that were happening in my life that were um, leading me to write those other books. But the Aquarian Shaman was really almost like back here all the time. Bless you. It was almost just always right back here in my consciousness that it's coming. It's coming. And it just seems to me that astrologically with what I've been told about my chart, I have, you know, I have Aquarius rising. <coughs> I have Venus and Mars, both uh, in Aquarius. So even though I'm a Sag, Sagittarian, and I, you know, a sun sign and a Scorpio moon, I have all this Aquarian energy in my chart to bring, I think, the mysticism of my Scorpio moon and my enthusiasm with my Sagittarian energy to bring that and funnel it into an Aquarian, if you will, kind of dispensation. And I don't know if you remember the, um, I can't remember right this minute, you may remember, um, I think his last name was Ferguson, who wrote about Aquarius. Um, I can't think of the name of her book at this moment, but it was a huge hit. And I read that years ago, and I remember thinking like, Oh, it's on its way. It's on its way. So I didn't particularly go like, oh, this is astrologically happening. So this is going to write this. But what happened, it was just this urge and this feeling. And I started writing on this book seven or eight years ago, but then published others first. And then it just popped up last year. And it was like, it's time. I'm like, it's time. And then everyone I talked to in the ast astrological world said, it's perfect. This is perfect for this time when we're seeing that, or at least I'm saying, and others I know, that the healer, the teacher, the shaman is within. And ultimately, that's what all spiritual paths from Christianity 
talking about the Holy Spirit that comes with and that's with us, talking about the guru is within. When you talk to the gurus, they say you must find the guru within. That we've been moving towards this for a very long time. And when I would talk to Grandmother Twyla, and I'll just show you a quick picture of her. She was my, I, had, I still say she is, even because she's on the other side. She talks to me all the time in the dream time. She was a Seneca Wolf Clan grandmama. That's me. Long time ago when I lived out in California. And she's got her hand on my head. You know, yeah. and she's the one who gave me my name, Star Wolf. And she, I'd ask her questions and she'd always say, well, what do you think? <laughs> and I would say, <laughs> and I would think, oh, God, please let me get this right. You know, and, and I would say it and she said, that's pretty good. <laughs> you know, and I'd say, well, what do you think, Graham? And then she'd share with me. You know, and she said, sweetheart, follow your heart. If you follow, she said, I'm not talking about your emotions. Follow your heart's wisdom. She said that, you know, the Aquarian energy that you're talking about. She said, I know about that energy. She said, I'm in touch with that. And she said, and I continue to follow my heart. Seek wise counsel, but follow your heart. And I've remembered that very deeply. And then she said, now show me how to do that breathing thing you do. <laughs> so I flew her out to California where I was living at the time outside of San Francisco and Fairfax. And I just so happened I was having a workshop during that time. And I brought her in and people were like, oh, my God, we're getting to meet grandmother Twyla, the Wolf Clan grandmother. And she was in her 80s at that time. She passed it on, on to the other side at 94. And I brought her there and her son and some other people and um, some Mayan elders and stuff for this week long that we had. And uh, I pulled her out a great big comfortable rocking chair and set it right in the middle of the room. We got the pulled the shades down, made it kind of dark, and everybody else was lying down on mats. And so for about an hour, everybody breathed and she breathed. And when it was over, I noticed she had tears running down her cheek, her cheeks. And I went over, I said, Graham, are you okay? And she said, Yes. And I said, I saw you crying. And she said, I wish I had have found this earlier. You know, Which made me cry. <laughs> I was like, oh. The spirit of her must be with you now because yeah, you know, I just had my throat you yes. know, has been doing something, and I've had tears running down my face. Um, so I'm sure her spirit is with us now. Sandy, so, I can tell you she is with you right now. I wouldn't be surprised if you dream about her tonight or if she comes to you and gives you her medicine. Oh, that would be lovely. I would definitely welcome that. And and you're so right. The timing of a book is perfect. You know, it's it's so important. And so many people are waking up right now and they are looking for the tools. They're looking for the guides. They're looking for the people they can trust who are going to lead them to the knowledge that, you know, that they want to remember. And to the knowledge that ultimately, just like we have an immune system, just like we have inspirations, that the wisdom we're seeking really is in our DNA. Yes. And it's in our spiritual DNA. We're programmed. Whatever the great mystery did, it programmed us to evolve and to awaken. And as Gene Houston would say, it, there's termas that come in one's life. And when that terma happens, it's a point. It's a, it's, the terma can become a turning point for you if you surrender to it and go through, a, a in many ways, a, a psychological death. Yeah. Yeah, and a renewal. Yeah. So the title of the book implies that there's a difference between shamanism and Aquarian shamanism. So why Aquarian? Well, the difference I would say, and you know, I don't know if there's a difference. What I would say is it's the, in, I feel it's the integration. I feel like it's the next evolution of shamanism. So it's just like um, everything I've learned before is not necessarily discredited or not important it's the stepping stones and we think about evolution with human beings right now i'm wondering if we're devolving you know a little bit or a lot but you know but sometimes we have to take a step back like a slingshot to get the momentum to go oh this sucks we got to move forward you know yes. 
So that's, I think that's just part of human nature. We just have to like, oh dear, okay. Oh, it's like Eeyore, oh dear, you know, and then we have to come forward and move forward. But the shamanism of old ancient wisdom is beautiful, just like all the ancient text. When you read the Bible in its original form, when you go back to the, you know, the Hindu teachings, the Buddhism, I'm thinking about how Paramahansa did a wonderful thing when he brought that philosophy into mainstream. So ancient wisdom is something that's in our DNA, just like the minerals in our bodies, our ancestors. It's with us. Many people who do shamanic breath work with me remember wisdom that they haven't learned in this lifetime. And so it's not that it's not still relevant and important, but like everything, everything in life that I know of, everything is renewing and evolving into even more wisdom. So it doesn't mean better or worse. I don't like the, that, model of that was bad. Now this, so we're going to have good now. To me, there's a divine perfection in the light and the dark. And believe me, I've learned a lot from the dark. I've learned a lot from the shadow. I love the light. I love to bask in the light. I love it when it's love and roses. And I, and I, I've learned enough (laughs) that I don't have to suffer as much anymore. My threshold for pain is less. I can hold it psychologically, but my patience for it is less. And I'm like, that hurts. I'm stopping it. (laughs) Okay. So it's just for me, common sense. But the Aquarian shaman energy, where it's uh, the, the new paradigm, if you will, that's evolving. At least this is my interpretation. And there's many. Is that we're at a time when there's seven to eight billion people on the planet We're taking up a lot of space, time, energy, and resources. And we don't have time to be children of God anymore. We must become adults of God. Or if you don't like the word God or God is, we must, if our species is going to survive, we must become adult, adults, not adult children, adults of the creator. And that means taking our rightful place, just like the trees have and the mountains and the oceans and the birds and the creatures of all kinds are perfectly who they are. We're not meant maybe to be, quote, perfect, but there's a way that human beings, we're at, I believe we're at a turning point and we're being asked to become the healer's the shamans ourselves. And that doesn't mean that there still might be, you know, the elders all around. In fact, any elder who's survived a war or the depression or an illness or anything else is a teacher, as far as I'm concerned, not just someone who calls himself a, a uh, shaman or a teacher. But I, so I don't want people to misunderstand me. I have tremendous respect for the indigenous elders And they always seem to like me, you know, and I always love them and respect them so deeply. And I know they can't save us. They can give us their wisdom if they choose to. They can explain things and walk a certain path. And I'm still learning from them. I have one people that I look at that I still learn from and call up regularly, actually. And I have access to phone calls to, to these folks. But I'm very clear that with this amount of people on the planet, that there's got to be a major consciousness shift. And that's my mission. That's my shamanic mission is to help awaken the Aquarian shaman within each of us Mm -hmm. so that we can make the right decisions for ourselves, for our loved ones and for the planet. So if I understand you correctly, you know, one has always thought of, shamans as being these elevated highly trained um highly connected individuals um but they're over there and we're here and we may follow them we may learn from them but we can't be them but it sounds to me as though what you're saying is the aquarian 
shaman is for everybody. We can all become yes. an Aquarian shaman. Yes, yes. And the person that instilled that even more, most in with me, I, I said to Grandmother Twyla, uh, is, you know, like, I could never be you. And she said, well, I hope not. <laughs> be you, you know. But the person truly before I met Grandmother Twyla that put me on my breathwork path, she's 89 now, Jacqueline Small. I don't know if you know Jacqueline. If you don't, you want to look up her books. We were talking, um, we talked for three hours the other day. She was my first breathwork teacher. And I met her when I was 29 years old, 20, 28 years old. Yeah, 28. And we were talking and she um, was there in the beginning with Stan Groff and Christina when they were developing holotropic breath work. And then she developed, and she was also with Leonard Orr uh, with rebirthing and she birthed the integrative breath work. So I hung out with Stan and Christina and um, Marion Woodman and all these wonderful people. Um, Gabriel Roth, I don't know if you know who these people are, but they were just, they, Ram Das. he said in our circle, you know, these people were just sitting there. We would did breath work together, you know, and then Jacqueline and Stan separated their programs and she created integrated breath work. And I became one of her lead trainers. And this is us, this is me back in my uh, early uh, Aquarian shaman years. And this is Jacqueline and she's 89 now and I'm 72. But we're there at the training program. We've just breathed a huge group of people. And we're just, as you can see, we're just full of light and energy. Mm -hmm. Jacqueline's written about nine or 10 books herself. And um, if there was ever an Aquarian shaman, it was her. Mm -hmm. My God, she knew all these people intimately. And when she asked them to come, they would come. And I was just a little gal from Kentucky, didn't know who a lot of them were at the time. And she said, that's Ram Dass. I'm like, who, who's Ram Dass? And she said, be here now. And I went, that Ram does, you know. And I remember I went over and I hugged him and he was so tall and he kissed me on the forehead. And I said, wow, that just made my day. He said, mine too. <laughs> so it was people like Paramahansa and Ram Das and all these other people who were beginning to, and Leonard Orr, who were saying, yes, there's these masters. Leonard had been off and been with Babaji, you know, and um, and Leonard became a really good friend of mine the last few years before he passed. But all of these teachers were saying, it's time for us. It's time for us to be the grown-ups now. And so they didn't necessarily call it the Aquarian shaman or even say Aquarius, but that's what they implanted in me when I was in my 30s and my 40s. And then all of a sudden it was like, they're talking about us stepping into being the yogis, the shamans, yes. the way showers. In other words, and then I started teaching because in uh, the addiction world, I taught about adult children, you know, the adult children syndrome, you know, of growing up and being wounded and because of your parents and how to heal those wounds. We did a lot of breath work to do that. I introduced that into the mental health system. I introduced it into the where they would let me into the addiction fields, things like that. And then I said, okay, I'm too restricted. I'm going to go do this on my own. But at the same time, I became aware that out of everything we were doing with people, all the charts we were doing, all the uh, explanations we were doing with people, that I could have people at a treatment center. They wouldn't let me have them lie down on the floor. But I could have them sit at a table in a room with the lights turned down, with a piece of paper in front of them with some crayons, I could put some music on, I could guide them just a little bit and then just tell them to breathe and to draw whatever they were seeing and feeling and to close their eyes and then open and draw and to let themselves feel whatever emotions they felt. I could do that for 30 minutes, flip the black back light on, uh, back on, and I would have gotten further because then we would process it. I would have gotten further with those people. And this is not bragging. It's just the reality, Sandy. Than therapists or counselors or because some people are there against their will even, you know. Than anybody else was at that time. And, you know, it was it was such a strange thing because on the one hand, people are saying, that's great work you're doing. Now stop doing it because, you know, it's too dangerous. <laughs> I'm like, these people mm. are dying from addiction. How dangerous could it be? <laughs> yeah. It's like there was certainly a lot of that around. 
You know yeah. what I'm talking about, don't you? Yeah. I do. You yeah. Do. yeah. So the Aquarian shaman energy is saying we can't wait. We've got, you know, human beings need to grow up. Yeah. And we've got it all inside us. We just we need to connect with it. Yeah. Well, we're going to take a short break now. You're listening to What Is Going On. I'm Sandy Sedgbeer, and my guest today is shamanic visionary teacher, guide, author, and creator of the shamanic breathwork process, Star Wolf. And we're talking about her latest book, The Aquarian Shaman, Walking the Spiral Path of Transformation. We'll be back with more from Star Wolf after this break. Home Times TV. Hello, I'm Sandy Sedgbeer, host of Bomb Times flagship radio show, What Is Going On? And as an author, editor and 13 times book judge who's read thousands of books and interviewed hundreds of authors, I'm constantly asked what's really worth reading and what's not. So I created the No BS Spiritual Book Club to help you save time and money by picking the brains of discerning names who have walked this path before you. There's no catch, no fees and no BS. Just an ever-growing library of 10 best spiritual book lists from some of your favourite authors and teachers, plus free book excerpts, audios and video interviews with people like Don Miguel Ruiz Jr., David G., Lee Harris, Mark Nepo and more. From well-known classics to hidden gems you've never heard of, it's the only no BS guide to the best spiritual books to enlighten your journey of self-discovery. So why not join the club? Get inspired and save money at the no BS spiritual book club.com. Imagine becoming a super influencer, reinvent yourself, invest in your brand, and then manifest your success with a robust spheric approach. Own times media and broadcasting offers a unique and multifaceted way to become the spiritual and conscious influencer. You deserve to be by putting your message across our powerful platform with its proven record of integrity and excellence. Through our produced shows, Own Times offers the opportunity to become a social media TV personality, a radio show host, an Own Times magazine columnist, and a syndicated podcaster, all in one shot. By live streaming your show on Ohm Times TV and broadcasting it across the extensive Ohm Times radio and TV networks, you become more than a host. You become an ambassador and a force for positive change. Ohm Times, open yourself to the possibilities. Everything that we do, we can do in a contemplative manner. Through the art of contemplation, you can use the gene keys in a really powerful way. Gene Keys is basically the code book of life. In the Gene Keys, the book is made up of these three levels, shadows, gifts, and cities. And the journey is from, is through those three levels, kind of unpicking of the shadow states, the releasing of the gifts, and then the embodying of this higher consciousness called the city. And the cities are very exalted words. And it's not like we, we kind of suddenly are all these exalted Christ-like beings but we have flashes and illuminations along the journey. And the more we get stuck into the journey, the more illumination comes to us because the more we're releasing the light from in these codes inside our DNA. So all those revelations are inside us. So the contemplative way is the inner way. There are 16 million children struggling with hunger in America. That's one in five daughters, sons, neighbors, and classmates who don't know where their next meal is coming from. Yet billions of pounds of good food go to waste every year. It's time we do something about it. Feeding America is a nationwide network of food banks that helps provide meals to millions of kids and families in need. Visit feedingamerica.org to help them feed even more. Together, we can solve hunger. Together, we're Feeding America. Welcome back. Star Wolf, you say that embodying Aquarian shamanic consciousness can help transform our planet. Tell me, what would a practice of Aquarian shamanism look like in everyday life? Well, it just so happens that during that little break, this Aquarian shaman burned a little sage. And sage is a part of my everyday life. 
And this beautiful wing came from a um, swan that passed naturally in Iceland. And one of my graduate students sent it to me and it's, it's a treasure for me because the swan in Grandmother Twyla's tradition represents surrender of the heart. And Grandmother Twyla, for a lot of people who may not know, I just want to say this, so many people are familiar with the medicine cards, those medicine, mm. that's her teachings, that's her body of teachings and that she passed on to Jamie Sams. And it's the most popular deck in the world. So Grandmother Twyla was such an Aquarian shaman already herself. The burning of the sage, I've burned it so much in my life. I've been in so many ceremonies with so many beautiful teachers that just lighting it brings back a rush. Just like when you're a child and you smell cotton candy or popcorn popping, it automatically opens up all those pathways in my brain and in my body, in my memory body to put me in a position <clears throat> where I'm ready to release anything in my field, whether it's in my negative thinking, whether something's happened and I'm obsessing about it or the political world, you know, especially I've been smudging a lot lately around all of that, but it's, um, I just drop in immediately to a place of, of letting and releasing and letting go. And I think about the beautiful energy of this purity of the swan and the heart and spirit. And that drops me into a different level of consciousness. That's just one thing that I will do. If I find myself zipping around because I've got 30 things to do, I'm also important, you know. And that kind of thing in my mind, I can get like that. I'm just like, stop. And I walk right out on my deck because we have 50 acres here, or it has us, I should say, on top of this beautiful mountain in Western North Carolina, looking out at the mountains, the rivers across the road. We have a creek on the land. We have creatures everywhere. And I've been here for 22 years. So I have all these beautiful bushes and plants that have planted themselves or that I planted that lean over my patio porch and I go out into nature and now because of the many many generations of butterflies and bees that come I can just walk out and I can put my finger up to the butterfly bush a butterfly I think it's a great great grandchild of the ones that, that you know they said go there she's safe and if she puts her finger out it's okay to stand on it you know the same thing with the bees I'll put those big black fuzzy ones and people say oh what's a bee I'm like stop I'll go over, I put my hand out underneath the bush, underneath the rose, and let it crawl into my hand. There's a reciprocity with nature, a beautiful reciprocity with nature that heals me. To me, it's an affirmation when they don't sting me, and they haven't in a long time. And I feel my flowers, when they see me coming, fling their hair, their petals, and fluff up. You know, like here she comes. She's the one that waters us and loves us and talks to us, the crazy lady that we love. And there's that talking with my plants, talking with my creatures. And I'm theirs too, by the way. They don't belong to me. We belong to each other. And my wolf dogs that live here with me, my husband, my community, my friends, all of this is ritual and ceremony for me. All of this regulates my nervous system that nervous system that that little hypersensitive, you know, crystal child could not do for herself that her Mammy Jones did for her. Now as an adult, it's my responsibility. And I've learned that I'm only a few breaths away from the Aquarian shaman every day of my life. I can be a hot mess self if I want to and go into my shadow and pull the cover over my head and say, I won't get up and I won't do this and I won't do that. Grandmother Twyla told me when she was little that her grandfather told her, Grandfather Shango Mo Moses heard, he told her she was going to grow up and be the chief, be the leader of her tribe uh, of the Wolf Clan. And she said she pulled her hair in her face and she pouted and she said, you can't make me. And then later on, she said, as she got older, that she would always hear her father, her grandfather's voice and see the twinkle in his eye. And he, he appreciated that she was so sp spunky little Sagittarian girl and loved her dearly. And he taught her. 
So are you saying that if we embody the shamanic consciousness, the Aquarian shamanic consciousness, our lives will be so different, you know, that we will naturally find our connection to nature, to the earth, yes. to one another, to ourselves. We will be different and society would be different. And this is how we can change the world. Well said, Sandy. You should write that down. <laughs> I'm serious. That was beautiful. That was really, you know, just such a flow. Because I think we're all born shamanic. I mean, look at our birth. There's nothing more shamanic than birth and death. That kind mm -hmm. of is a signal that <clears throat> you're shamanic. Did you know how you got conceived and born? And, you know, how you might leave. And in between, we have others actually minor compared to birth and death minor births and deaths. I'm not trying to trivialize it, especially the sexual abuse or illness or anything else. But I myself, um, you know, I'm remarried now happily and, and feel really happy in my life. But I was deeply in love with a beloved that I did this work with, that we traveled and he helped develop this work with me so much in the beginning. And I traveled with him for two years through his cancer journey. And he passed in my arms. And the last thing that we did was the breath work. And that's what we were doing when he passed. And he, that's how he wanted to leave. He had a D, uh, D, do not recess, DNR written on his chest and in the hospital. And he said, if they come in, no. So I laid down and held him and he breathed and he breathed himself out. And that was one of the hardest things I ever did. But it also, it was so beautiful mm -hmm. because in the days to come, he showed up so many times with all kinds of things to let me know that he was okay, including turning on an, a computer that was turned off to a song that we listened to. And I didn't even have, at that time, it was iTunes people used to listen to, didn't even have it pulled up and I was sleeping. So there's so much we don't know about birth life and death mm. we're here to explore that sandy yeah. so in the book the aquarian shaman i mean it's filled with ancient shamanic practices rituals ceremonies wisdom i mean you cover just you know many techniques and components and journeying totem animals spirit teachers elements of nature, et cetera. Do you think it's possible that we can become an Aquarian shaman from reading a book and following, you know, practicing some of these tools that we don't have to go and be trained by somebody, that we could actually, you know, embody this, utilizing what you're offering in this book? So without dishonoring <clears throat> or discrediting the beautiful shamans that I've known in the past, the ones I know now, the medicine people who don't necessarily call themselves shamans, but that would be the word that a lot of us would refer to them as, and all around the world, because I have beautiful friends from Peru and from around the world who are indigenous, indigenous shamans in that to their country, their world. I'm going to come back to your question, but I want to say something about the word indigenous first, if I may. And that is, if you go somewhere and somebody says that plant is indigenous to this area or that animal is indigenous to this area, there is one thing that all human beings have in common. And I wish this was an original, but this is what Grandmother Twyla said to me because I asked her these questions that you're asking me many years ago. I have blonde hair. I have blue eyes. I'm from, you know, my family's all from Europe. You know, they were probably burned at the stake. I just feel that in my body. You know, I just know that's true. But, you know, you know, is this okay that I'm doing this and everything? And what she said to me is the, the most important thing for you to remember is that all people, animals, nature is indigenous to the earth. We all belong to Mother Earth. She is our mother. 
just like you might have differences if you have different family members or uh, brothers or sisters or whatever. There's differences with cultures and countries. And I never, never, never want to be flip or, or, or shallow around that. And especially with the genocide that has happened and people's horrible um, treatment of other people for practicing their spiritual ways or their cultures, which is horrible. So I don't want to get that confused with this. I have deep honoring and respect and, you know, for um, people who have not been allowed to do their ceremonies. Grandmother Twyla was on the team that tried to, and that did help get the Religious Freedom Act passed so that Native Americans could practice their spirituality again. She was, she went to Washington, little five foot gal that she was. Okay. So that we need to separate that out from that. Okay. But the indigenous part for me is, is like grandmother Twyla said, she said, we all need to come together. We all need to remember this Aquarian energy that we belong to the earth, that we're indigenous to the earth. We respect the differences. She created this sacred circle and she said, it's called the talking stick circle. And in that circle, and of course, other things had particular circles, but this was the kind that she did, that every person had their sacred point of view. And your only responsibility and obligation was to listen and do your best not to have other things going on in your head. What each sacred point of view was, and then not attacking or counterattacking to state yours. And that just in the listening, we begin to understand each other. And that it's not about being critical of anyone or anything else. It's about what is my sacred point of view. So she was very Aquarian in her own nature. And so, yes, I believe that the way showers like Grandmother Twyla, like the way showers like Ram Das. Some that you wouldn't know of different teachers, Mayan teachers. I've met so many different indigenous teachers who've said the same thing to me that Grandmother Twyla said. They were wise and they said, yes, we have our people. This is what we're doing, these are efforts, but we need you too. It's not going to change without all of us. And so I've been blessed in that way. I was blessed at the Sundance with the chief there who said to me, please go back and share this medicine. So the enlightened people that I feel that I have met and known, they've seen my heart, they've known um, what my intention was, but also my actions were, you know, when I was there, the chiefs, I'm not going to say who, but a family member had addiction problems and I supported the help with that, you know, so they understand I wasn't there just to take, I was there to learn and I was learning to go back to help make this world a better place for all of us. So we're all indigenous to the earth, as Grandmother Twyla would say. We all should look at it. Uh, Matthew Fox said we should all look into our own spiritual paths and take it apart and look at it and see what's relevant and what's not. He did mm -hmm. that with the Catholic Church. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I went to his school during that time when he was being accused of cavorting with a witch. <laughs> That's what he said. I remember him standing up and he said, apparently I'm being fired from the Vatican. I got a pink slip for cavorting with a witch. <laughs> Yeah, I, you know, he's I love that. He said, I'm not sure what the cavorting was. I don't <laughs> remember it. <laughs> he said, but she was a witch. She may have drugged me. <laughs> we only have about six minutes left. There's a, one question that I want to ask you, and I know that there's something that you want to read to us. And um, first, the question in 2010, you published a book titled The 30 Shamanic Questions for Humanity from ego agenda to soul purpose, remembering the bigger picture. We don't have time for those 30 questions, but if you had to pick one really important question that people, anyone watching this, you know, should mm -hmm. take on board and ask themselves, what would it be? Oh gosh, you know, just thinking about those questions, those questions were written, they were inspired because the person who um, that I was very close to was uh, told me she was considering suicide. And I sat down and prayed and I asked my higher power what I could do to help her. 
and uh, just like an hour later, the questions were written and I barely remembered it. She was the first person who did those questions. And as she did those questions and answered them, um, you know, and she speaks about it freely, so I'm not breaking her anonymity. She's been on my team ever since. And does those questions with in our groups with people and um, and the books have traveled all around the world. People have worked them. So on a different day, I would say the questions, you might enjoy knowing this, Sandy. I'm doing those questions again myself right now. I'm on question 18 with one of my, with one of my very best friends, who's one of the main Hoffman teachers at the Hoffman process, my, uh, my best buddy. And we're on question 18 right now together. So I just wanted to say that for people who feel like you go, ta-da, <laughs> you're done, that I said, I'm really feeling this need right now to do the questions again. And so it's a spiral path, right? Yeah. So I think that that's the first thing is probably at the beginning when the question is asked, are you ready to surrender? Are you ready to enter into a process of ego death again, again? Now, that seemed like a good idea. I thought, I'm launching this book. This is a really good time for me to do these questions. Now that I'm on question 18, which is, you know, just slightly past half, I'm like, what was I thinking? <laughs> but of course it's perfect. Of course it's perfect. It's just when you get to the middle of the journey, you're like, am I going to make it all the way through <laughs> to the other side? Yeah. Okay. So before you read what you want to read to us, one other question. How can we build community support for Aquarian? shamanism and share it with our friends and families yeah well you know i think that being a planetary service is where it's at i think that's what aquarian shamanism is about and it's not like planetary service and you know and starving yourself or you know it's it's not about being a vegan or vegetarian although it can be you know half my friends are, are paleo and the other half are vegans and vegetarian you know it's about finding your path of service. What is that to you? Whether it's writing a book, whether it's doing what you're doing here, what an incredible, you're an Aquarian shaman, you're already doing it. This is, you know, what you're doing is, is beautiful. You're bringing so much to so many people that's inspiring people. I believe that the, the biggest thing that Aquarian shamans can do is inspire people. Inspire, you know, inspire means to inspire it is to inspire other people with your medicine, whatever it is, yoga, breath work, knitting, uh, healthy cooking, uh, taking, I'm seeing all these things on Facebook now called foresting. I think, are they talking about walking in the woods like I do every day, you know? Mm -hmm. But whatever your gift is, uh, and maybe you don't know yet, and that's where a lot of times we come in at Venus Rising um, is, helping people remember that they had an original imprint at birth, that they have karma, that they have, um, they're just like a seed of a plant is destined to look a certain way and have certain characteristics. We mm. have lots of free will, no doubt about it, but there is this beautiful, I think behind the scenes, great mystery, gently and sometimes not so gently, guiding us to the perfection of our soul's lotus that's unfolding. Mm. So there's there's a lot of help. We're going to have to hurry it up now if we're going to hear what it okay. is you read to us. Okay. So we've got about probably one minute. Okay. So I'm just opened up. I just, that's what I decided to do. I like to do that. So I opened up to the good medicine chest. The good medicine chest. In the shamanic world, it's important to cultivate and create your good medicine chest, the heart. In all areas of your life, medicine does not mean taking a pill to make you feel better. It could be, but it's not necessarily. Our personal medicine is connected to our inner shamanic voice that guides us towards personal power and our spiritual healing gifts that we were born with. As children, 
we were very close and connected to our true essence. And we knew how to play into the aspects of ourselves. We are natural shapeshifters saying things like, let's be Batman and Robin or the prince and the princess, whatever. In our curiosity and our creative genius, we will act out our different future selves that we can imagine and embody. These are the first experience of archetypes. Later, they may serve you again when you're ready. Beautiful. So uh, before we close, I just want to tell everybody that you are having um, an Aquarian Shaman book talk live Zoom celebration um, on the 29th of September, the 30th of September and October the 1st. And you're going to be giving people an experience opening to the Aquarian Shaman within and you're going to share experiences and have questions and answers. That is completely free and anyone can join it and we'll tell them at the end where to go to register for that. Um, I want to say thank you very much for being with us today, Star Wars. Oh, yeah. It's been a real treat. Well, thank you, Sandy. I want to thank Christopher too. Thank you, Christopher. But Sandy, I just feel like if we were um, in close proximity, we'd probably end up in jail together. <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously, I have a really kindred spirit with you. And thank you so much for following your inner shaman. You're clearly in your dharma. And um, thank you for this beautiful interview. Yeah, so welcome. Our pleasure. The Aquarian Shaman Walk in the Spiritual Path of Transformation is published by Inner Traditions. And for more information about Star Wolf's books work, the Venus Rising Association for Transformation and University, visit shamanicbreathwork.org. That's it for this week. I'll be back at the same time next week with another edition of What is Going On. Till then, it's goodbye for me. And once again, many thanks, Star Wolf. <laughs>